and you're watching What Next, Mr. President, as we count down to May 29th, when President Muhammad Buhari will be taking office for his second tenure. And today we are focusing on security, which is one of the biggest challenges this country has had. Apart from economy, a lot of people will tell you security is an issue, especially up north in Nigeria. In fact, every region in this country has its own security concern. And today on the show, we will be addressing these. What should the president do? How should he tackle security issues in this country? My name is Gloria Oji Emode, and to have this conversation with us right here in the studio is Captain Johnson Bish. He is a former captain in the U.S. Army and a national security and defense strategist. Welcome to the show. Thank you. All right. So there, when we talk about security challenges in Nigeria, it's cut across. There's so many. So let's start with the most recent, which is the crises we're seeing in Kajuru, uh, um, Kaduna State, whether to call it crisis or violence, but widespread violence where civilians are killed, reported and some unreported. Now, what do you think could be responsible for this? Bearing in mind that Kaduna is a very peculiar uh, um, um, state and has been volatile for years. How can this thing be tackled and what should be Pre the president be focusing on in Kaduna State? Right. Um, so when I discuss Nigerian issues, I don't usually like to focus on temporary solutions. Please. Because that is where we've gotten it wrong in this country because we try to look at what can be done now to provide an immediate, you know, soccer or basically to kick the can down the road and wait for the next person to come and begin to tackle the problem. Um, the problem in Kaduna State has been there for quite a long time now, several decades. And that is because of, like you rightly pointed out, the peculiar nature of Kaduna State. Kaduna State, in a way, is like a miniature of Nigeria, where you have the northern, uh, Muslim north, and then you have the Christian south. Um, and Particularly, most of the problems that you see in Kaduna State are usually religious, tribal, and economic. So there won't be an immediate solution to it. Oh. No. We, if we want to solve the problem, we can, we can suppress the problem for now by deploying massive presence of security agents in the area. But that is not, going, that is not, a, that is not a permanent solution to the problem. If you're intent and you're honest and you want to solve the problem once and for all, you have to go back to the root causes of those problems. Which are? Which basically, like I, I pointed out, mm -hmm. there's issue of economics. Um, you've got this um, Fulani community that are residing within the Christian communities in, in southern Kaduna state. Mm -hmm. They're all competing for land and stuff like that. So it, what is happening in southern Kaduna is not very different from what is happening in Benue and other parts of the Middle Belt, which Southern Kaduna, in my own calculation, is even better off being considered as middle belt. But because of the, the, the way our states are structured, mm. you know, where one man sits in Abuja and begins to draw the map and tear the countries into pieces without actually giving consideration to the, you know, cultural affinity of the people that you're trying to bring together, which is one of the problems in Kaduna state. It would have been easier to have Southern Kaduna as part of Plateau State. Are you trying to say that Kaduna State should have been broken? It shouldn't have been a, a state, but Southern Kaduna be part of Plateau or it's, a it's, different... It, it, Southern state. Kaduna is a state of its own. Oh. Or the Southern Kaduna is joined with other, you know, parts of the Middle Belt because they are from the Middle Belt. Southern Kaduna is part of the Middle you Belt. You do know what you're proposing here? Yeah. The breaking of a state oh, oh. as a means of solving the security issue. In that it. is what I'm trying to tell you. You see, God in his infinite wisdom created society uh, in a way that they are stable. But we as humans, we go there and we you know, destroy the equilibrium that God has put in place. And this is what is happening in Nigeria from, from region to region is that we created a whole bunch of number of states which had due consideration to relationships, cultural affinity. By so doing, we destroyed the natural equilibrium that God has put in place there. Okay. That is what is happening in Kaduna. So that is why I'm trying to tell you that it's not an overnight, there's no overnight solution to it. Any overnight solution to the problem in Kaduna and even some other parts of this country is just to suppress it momentarily 
and, and then it will spring up again up underneath eventually they're going to explode and we have a much more bigger problem Let, let's move on to zamfara state a typical example of banditry i mean towards late last year we saw a, a, a governor yari practically begging federal government to declare a state of emergency in zamfara which is weird for a governor to be asking for we saw kidnappings we saw murder it was crazy in zamfara state what do you think could have led to that because zamfara seemed like a very stable northern state until all of a sudden it it, it, it ruptured into what we saw in the news what could have been responsible for all that banditry and what is the way to handle it right now if you look at what is happening in that area it's not just zamfara you know that the problem is equally spreading to Sokoto state, mm. you know, even to some extent Casino state. These mm. are border states. And to the extent that our northern segment of our borders remain porous, which is what some of us have been advocating for, for a tighter border security, so that we can monitor who and who is coming into this country, where are they coming into, what are they coming in here for, how long are they going to stay here, so that we can properly track them. If you look at some of the problems we had in this country, especially up in the north, security issues, there are even questions as to whether some of the key actors or perpetrators of these you know, security problems are even Nigerians. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a question whether even Abu Bakr Shikau is even a Nigerian. Mm. There was a, a, a Montisana in the 80s who is from northern Cameroon mm. but was resident in Kano and uh, was radicalizing Nigerians in Kano to the extent that it led to the problem that we have in the 80s. So to, to your question, for as long as those borders remain as porous as they are today, and we don't know who is coming here, what is it they are coming for, to that extent we will continue to have those cross-border so, problems. So the banditry is a cross-border problem. I see. You understand? So it didn't spring from within these states, but from outside no, of these no, states. No, no, they were not organic to those, to those I states. I see. Interesting. Let's go to Boko Haram. Boko Haram still becomes one of the big... It still is the biggest challenge this administration has had. Of course, um, um, in the first tenure, which we are stepping out of, President Muhammad Buhari did promise that he was going to tackle the case of Boko Haram that hasn't really happened even though the the government continues to claim they are winning the war on terrorism we know that Boko Haram is still a very viable threat in the northeast what are the possible solutions in this situation i have to tell you that when it comes to the issue of terrorism there is no silver bullet to it um there was a research that was carried out by um uh, there's a research company in the u.s I'm trying to remember them. Um, they, they carried out a research on insurgency and terrorism. Mm -hmm. And the conclusion they arrived at is that, on the average, they take about 20 years for you to solve the problem. Uh, when Muhammad Buhari came into power, I know that he was not going to solve that problem. It so was, it was more of a campaign promise? It, it has to be. It has to be. I know he was not going to solve the problem because that problem is not a one term or even one presidency problem. This is a problem that he inherited from, from the, the previous, previous administration, administration. Yes. And I will not be surprised if another administration comes in and inherits that problem from him. But however, we can, we can reduce it. Now, to some extent, that has happened. With but military it, intervention. Exactly. But that's not the only solution to solving issues of insurgency and terrorism. You know, what military does is you know, elimination of the physical threat, you know, but you have to equally, the same way you have to look at the remote causes of the problems that we have in, in Kaduna State, you equally have to look at the, the causes of the problems that we have in northeastern Nigeria. You know, northeastern Nigeria has been, for a very long period of time, a, a very impoverished part of this country. And when you have a large population of your citizens living in abject poverty, there is no opportunity there is no inclusiveness and so they are really at the margin of the society mm -hmm. these kind of things tend to you know have a breeding ground in those kind of areas so now if we are truly interested in not only eliminating the physical threat but solving the problem permanently it means that we have to look at issue of you know inclusive governance we have to reduce corruption um, we have to um, create more opportunities for people. So, so you're saying the issue of Boko Haram is not just on the face set of we don't want education or we want more of Sharia law. It is more about economic uh, yeah. deficiencies in these there's areas. There's economic, there's social, there's political. Religious? Uh, 
there is, there is, there is an angle of religion in it because majority of the people who are involved in it are from one uh, religious but you don't think it's a major fact because a lot of people look at Boko Haram insurgency more about you know terrorism from or by uh, 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 Muslims fighting to Islamize the country or the region. That is what some people think. But you're looking at it more like that is not the major, the major issue. It's, it's not the major issue. Why I agree that, you know, most terrorists are, are, are Muslims. Mm -hmm. I don't agree that most Muslims are terrorists. True. Now, it, it, the question you should have asked yourself, why is it, is it only Boronu? Is it only that area that we have Muslims in this country? The people in that particular region, are they more Islamic than the people from the other states in Nigeria mm -hmm. where you don't have these problems? If you look at it and you draw that parallel, you will discover that it's not uh, mostly about religion. religion, about yes. religion. It's, it's, right. it's economics. There are so many factors that have contributed to it. Let's move on a little bit. You know, when the Metele attack occurred, we talked about it. We had a great conversation about it. And then one of the things that we really looked at in that conversation I remember quite well is corruption in the Nigerian military which you said had a lot to do with um, the way corruption or rather the way the, the, the Boko Haram has been fought in the Northeast. I want to find out in your opinion based on the fact that you're a national security and defense strategist how should the corruption which we know exists in the military be tackled so that the fight against the terrorism can be more effective? Well, that's where we are going to get it wrong. Um, if you want to localize the corruption to the military... No, of course I know it's Nigeria-wise, but the reason correct. why uh, 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 corruption in the military feels ambiguous or too hard to handle is because in the military, civilians don't come in to audit and pay, you well, know, have let me, access let me, to information. Let me tell you one thing. Mm -hmm. There is no institution that exists in isolation in anywhere in the world. Okay. All institutions are interwoven, and it's like a system, you know, with several organs. To the extent that one organ in that system is not functioning very well, uh, the entire system becomes paralyzed. You cannot solve corruption in the military in isolation because you have to bring together all the various institutions of government. For example, you know that the military is not an anti-graft agency. True. Now, the EFCC is there, the ICPC is there. If EFCC and ICPC are strengthened enough to the point that they can go into the Ministry of Defense and do their job without interference, you will be able to solve the issue of corruption in the military. The military cannot, they, they can't, the, the way this country is, it's difficult for the military to self police themselves. There has to be an external body or external institution that is above the fray that can go in there and police the military, the, the military and reduce the, reduce the corruption there. Mm -hmm. So if we want to tackle it, Ministry of Defense or Defense in isolation of all the other agencies of government, we're going to fail. We need robust, strong, and strengthened institutions across the board in this country. Mm. Now, if, 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 if a military personnel is, is, is indicted for corruption, the person has to be taken to court. Now, if you take that individual to court and the judiciary in a way is corrupt, the person will be freed and he will return back to the military. Have sure. you been able to solve the problem? You haven't. Yeah. That is why it has to be a holistic approach to Correct. it. Let's also talk about appointments into the military. I know at some point in this country, a lot of people criticize, still criticize, you know, the method of appointment of service chiefs by the president who they say those appointments have been very more of nepotic. They have, um, he has concentrated on one part of the country, which is the northern part of the country. Now, I want to get your thoughts as well as a security expert. Do you think... I wouldn't say the caliber of people that he is hiring, but do you think uh, the alleged nepotistic method of appointments of the president, especially in security matters, has affected the way, uh, uh, I don't know, insurgency, security issues have been handled in this country? Do you think it has any connection? Um, ordinarily, it shouldn't have affected it, okay? Um, if you appoint the people with the right experience and the right knowledge into various positions. And uh, personally, I've taken a look at mm. people who occupy various strategic security positions in this country. It's not that they don't have the expertise or the knowledge. I think they're all qualified. Now, but if you look at, you know, diversity of our country and our culture, uh, it makes sense to me that we should have you know, security architecture that is reflective 
of the overall society, which is the nature of, of our country. Which is quite complex. Nigeria uh, is quite a complex country. Correct. Because if you look at the security challenges, because all this way we, we talk about the North, North East, it's not only in these areas not at all. that we have all these other security yeah. challenges. There are security challenges everywhere in this country, and there are no better people to solve their own security issues as the people who are from there. And that is why I have been one of the fiercest advocates for state policing. Because I believe that for you to be able to police a particular place 100%, you should be able to understand the culture. You must have lived in the area and even know some people. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you that where I reside in, 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 in Atlanta, you know, Lawrenceville, north mm -hmm. of Atlanta, most or even all the police officers who are in Lawrenceville Police Department were born there, grew up there, they spent all their life in that community. So they know every household. If something happens in Lawrenceville today, they will know who and who to look for. Mm -hmm. Even if, if, if it's not those people that actually committed the crime, they will give them, you know, leave that, that, will, that will lead yeah. them to whoever committed the crimes. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is that the, the security, you know, appointment should have been reflective of, 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 our, of our diversity. Mm -hmm. yeah, and the reason why I think we do that is so that we, we, we avoid this issue of groupthink where everybody has the same kind of reasoning there is no uh, uh, uh there is not uh, there, there's, there's no, no feeling of exclusion there, there's no this um dissenting opinion or view that would have allowed you to do some kind of critical thinking before arriving and, to your solution all right well, let's round this up um i heard i heard a group of people discussing something uh, on my way to work one time and they're they were complaining bitterly that VP Oshibanjo, Yemi Oshibanjo, is hardly ever invited into security meetings by the president. You have the sec secretary to the federal government of the federation present, you have the chief of staff present, you have the service chiefs, but you don't have the VP. Now, some people have even gone further to look at it as a conspiracy theory, maybe they're meeting to move the northern agenda forward. I want to get your thoughts on this as a security expert. Should the VP be at security meetings, at least we know for the last two, three, they're about he hasn't been present, should he be at security meetings? And if he should be, why do you think he's being excluded? Well, I don't know if he's being excluded because I don't have that information mm -hmm. myself. I'm not part of the government. Um, every information... But have you heard that? Have you heard, you know... I, I have, I've heard, you know, some kind of social media rumors and I, I, I don't base my analysis on, on some of the rumors you see on social media. All right, fair um, enough. But if... It is a fact that uh, the vice president has not been attending those security meetings. I don't think it portends well for this country. Um, one of the qualifications of running as a vice presidential candidate is that you know you have to as well qualify to be president. Should anything happen to your principal, you become from the one you become president. So it's important that the vice president is equally attending those meetings so that he is abreast with the security situation of the country because nobody knows what happens. Exactly. If you look at the history of the United States, you will discover that there has been so many instances where the president died and the vice president had to take over. Even in this That's country. The, even in this even country, the president here, was almost it, four it, it, away for it, more than exactly. three months even, on even medical in this, Even in this country, yeah. you saw what happened when Yira Dua died. Mm. The good president, good Lord Jonathan, who was vice president, then had to now become president. Mm. So that is why it's important that the vice president is attending these security meetings so that he is abreast with the security situation of the country. I want to say a big thank you to you, Captain Johnson Bish, for taking our time to talk to us right here on Roots TV. And of course, we've been watching What Next, Mr. President, as we count down to May 29th, when he'll be taking over the mantle for the second time for a second tenure. Give us your comments on this conversation on the comment section of this video and subscribe to our YouTube page. My name is Gloria Oje Emode.